Hello, today we're going to paint a castle. We're gonna do it together. It's gonna to turn out awesome and be completely amazing. And even if you haven't painted in watercolor before, I'm going to show you how to do it step by step. And I think you'll find that it's not that hard. So the first thing you're gonna do is get your picture out and find the horizon line. So I'm gonna to go to the top of these plants and you can see that it's still in the bottom half of the drawing, not quite cutting it in center. So let's sketch that down really quick. Zip. I think we're going to have to erase it a little bit. Because everything is about getting the proportions the same. If I were to divide this in half vertically and horizontally, give myself a few more by dividing each half and half, then this gives me a rough grid system that's going to help me to place my drawing. Okay, so you can obviously measure and make them more accurate, but for now, let me just kind of put the middle points and some of those on here really lightly so that we can erase as needed. Okay, this is the center of my drawing. The castle needs to sit over a little bit, like about here come up about like so, very, very scribbly at this point, it's fine. The only thing you want to keep in mind when you're sketching is that your sketch marks don't get so dark that you can't erase them cleanly. And I've got this cool sloping earth that comes up and goes down and joins with these bushes, zippity clippity, and we've got the land Juts in like this, some water, water, and down here a spit of grass. So that's very basically what the composition looks like. Now we have to go back and really clean it up. So I'll go back and choke up on the pencil. Now that those shapes are approximately the right size and place, and then as I clean up lines, I'm going to erase my sketchier lines. but I'm not going to do little details at this stage because I want to make sure that it looks completely right before I really commit to the shapes by adding all those details. This is the way that you can draw without making yourself crazy. If you always add the details before the large shapes are right, then you're going to wind up doing a whole lot of erasing and changing. And that's tough on the paper, but it's also tough on you psychologically. So it feels like, ugh, oh, I invested so much time into this sketch and now it's all wrong. Ugh, oh, I'm just gonna crumble it all up and start over again. If you learn to sketch lightly and not make small details until the large shapes are right, you're going to save yourself a lot of time and frustration. Also, not a bad idea to whip out the old triangle. If my verticals are right, and I draw everything else in terms of them, I'm going to have a better looking piece in the end and my castle will tend to slump to one side or the other. Now you can be as detail oriented and as exacting as you want in your sketching phase. It doesn't have to be really precise, especially if you're going to do a looser approach to the watercolor, but be aware that it is easier to leave details out if you know where they're supposed to be than it is to add details that you haven't accurately drawn from the beginning. So my advice is always going to be to spend a lot of the time on the initial sketch making sure that those large shapes are accurate because it's going to save you time and frustration later on. So after I have added the largest shapes I can go back and I can throw in some of those little things like the windows on the castle, balconies and whatever else. So I'm gonna take this off camera, I'm gonna polish up my sketch and I'll come back to you as we are ready to start painting. I'm satisfied with the initial drawing, so now I need to make a decision about how to paint it. If you look at the reference material, you can see that this castle is on top of a fairly light sky, especially here when it's juxtaposed against those clouds. 
So considering that, and then also these white sticks poking up in the foreground, whenever you have something white, and especially something small and delicate like these sticks or the edge of the castle, you need to decide if you're going to protect it before you start painting or if you're going to paint around. Now in the case of these sticks, I'm going to cut down most of them because I find them visually distracting and that's one of the benefits of painting. I think I'm going to keep a few but make them a little shorter. So I'll go first to the painting. I'm going to use some masking fluid. This is a masking fluid in an um, ultra-fine nib and it helps me to protect really fine lines. So I'll come and I'm just going to start at the bottom of some of these weeds. You squeeze it on, it's a fluid. And remember that everything that you save is going to be protected just exactly the same as you put it down, which means you have to be really careful and take your time. I'm going to also protect the edge of the castle See, I just squeeze around the outside edge. And then I'll use the back of a paintbrush to fill in. When your masking fluid is dry, then you can start painting. But wait until it's completely dry. It'll just take a couple of minutes. All right, the masking film is all dried, so we're ready to lay in the sky. You start with the sky because that's the thing that's farthest in the background. So the first decision you have to make is whether or not you're going to keep these clouds. I like the clouds. So I'm going to go ahead and keep them. I'm going to get a couple of pieces of scraps of watercolor paper. I'm going to lay those out and I'm going to use those to test my colors as I mix. So I have a palette and I'm adding water to the palette to activate the colors. And I might use a 2 h pencil and just really lightly sketch the general placement of those cloud shapes. And I'm going to use the largest brush that I can for the area. This is a 1 inch flat brush and I'm going to work wet on wet. So I'm going to paint around the clouds with just clean water. I'll get my reference material close. And then I'll do a test of the blue that I mixed up. Not quite the same. I have to adjust that. There we go. And then I'm going to quickly work and just fill in all of that wet color. I'm going to start at the top with just a band of paint and let it work down. And I'm not going to go all the way to the end of the water. You can see the difference here. Here I have a soft edge, here I have a hard edge. I want it to be a soft edge because clouds are soft. So after painting the first pass of paint, if I have too hard of an edge, I'm going to go back with a clean brush and just wash over the edge like this to soften it up even more. It's going to work best if I don't do it everywhere, but I keep a nice blend of soft and sharp edges. Then on the underside of the clouds, there's more shadow and some interesting details, so I'm going to paint with the clean water again and drop in some of those rough shapes. And then I'll use a purple and blue to make gray. Use the scrap paper to check your intensity again. And just wash right over the top. Don't be afraid to let colors mix right on the page. I'm going to use the brush on the edge for some of those intricate shapes. And then I'll go faster and use the flat side for some of the large just general shadows. And if I give myself a mix of colors and intensities, it's going to be more interesting. Now I'm going back into some of those wet patches and I'm adding some more intensity with some starker blues. This will help to give the clouds a sense of dimension. 
What you can also do to loosen up your texture and to get a little bit more interesting approach is use a little spritz bottle and lightly give a little spray. This will only work if your paint isn't completely dry. And you can even blend with your finger like you're doing finger painting. And sometimes that can give you just the look that you're looking for. All right, I think I like that, so I'm going to go ahead and let that dry, then we'll come back and take off the masking fluid. When your sky is dry, you can go ahead and take the masking fluid off of your castle. So just rub that off with my finger, and it rolls off. You can also use a rubber cement eraser. Make sure that you don't do this until you're satisfied with your background, but especially when it comes to skies, they don't have to look any particular way. You're going to come out farther ahead if you don't try to go back into it and muck around anymore after the first pass is dried because it's always going to look like you tried to fix a mistake. So that's great. Now I'm going to start on painting this castle. So to begin, don't make it too complex. Simplify things as much as possible. There's obviously a lot of detail in the castle, but we're going to start with just a smooth flat wash of gray. So get that test strip out again. Mix up a gray and try to match what you see. Oh, that's pretty good right there. Then I'm just going to carefully around the edges and then more quickly on the middle, lay in this flat color. This is the lighter color of the castle, so I can actually paint everything with it and then paint the darker side a shade darker. All right, so I'm just gonna let that dry, and while that's drying, I'm going to paint in some of these other details, like this kind of light sandy part, and then I'll let that dry and paint those vibrant greens. The sandy part, though, is between the castle and this grass, so these two colors aren't going to touch. I don't want anything to touch that will bleed. In this case, I didn't wet the canvas. I'm just painting wet on dry. This is a dry brush technique with not very much water on the paper before I start or in the brush when I'm painting. So I use this for small areas that need a little bit more texture. And there are some darker patches of brown in there as well. I can get pretty small lines with just the edge of my, pen, um, my brush here. Don't forget though that you really do need contrasts. Contrasts make a piece. So you're gonna need contrasts in line quality and in tone and in detail. Not everything can be at the same level. So not everything can be in sharp detail. Save those detailed places for the closest places to the viewer in the foreground. Over here is sort of dead, uninteresting brushes and weird bushes and stuff. So I'm gonna try to spice that up a bit with some more color. And in the background, it needs to be very dark because that's what I see on my reference. And that will give these bushes on a different level than the bushes closer forward. And in this area, I'll just quickly give the impression of this wet, brushy area, keeping some areas white because that's where the green is going to go. Don't assume that you can paint over colors Watercolor is a transparent medium, which means that you need to approach it sort of like you're building stained glass windows, with the colors stacking on top of each other and changing each other. All right, that's pretty good, so I'm going to stop there. We'll come back and add more detail to the castle in the background. Okay, this background is dry, so let's go ahead and put some greens in. For the greens, I'm going to use a round brush. Always test the color to make sure that it's right before you put it down. Okay, pretty good. And then I will paint it in as quickly as possible. If you try to paint with fewer strokes, then you're typically going to have a smoother, more polished look when the painting is finished versus kind of a pecked out look if you go too slow and try to go over and over spaces too often. I'm leaving a little white pathway. Don't forget to let those colors mix 
and to give it a nice watercolory feel I'm going to have some areas of wet and then some areas of dry. So as I'm sure you understand when you have wetter washes you're going to have less control over where the paint goes and what it does and when you have dry you retain a lot of control. So that's not to say that one is better than the other those are just two techniques that you're going to need to use both of to get um, different looks in your paintings. I have some green peeking through around the fence here and under these rocks and then between the stones that build up this little pathway there's some green so I'm just kind of going around looking for the green and dropping it in. I'm going to leave the green that's in the very foreground for last but we can go ahead and paint our bright blue river. One of the things that I really like about this reference material is the brightness of this really blue blue water. So I want to make sure that I get that matched. I'm going to go up to my half inch flat and I have an Antwerp blue that I bet is going to fit the bill really well, probably almost completely on its own. Yep. And then the river starts right over here. Very blue. And it changes color in this area and fades away from being blue. And then comes again back to itself. And it has these really interesting dark stones jutting up, but I can put those on after the blue is dry. Don't try to work around things if you don't absolutely have to, because whenever you work around a shape, you're interrupting the watercolor. And you don't really want to do that. So as often as you can, protect the lights if you have to, if the thing that you're painting around is lighter than the color that you're currently painting, or if it's darker, just paint straight over the top and paint it in when you're done. I've got a little bit of the blue that comes over here. And when you're painting water, it's another good rule of thumb to leave some whites, just randomly if you need to. The whites are going to look like sparkles and reflections and any other number of things, but you can't get them back once they're lost, so just try to leave some. Then in this dark area here, the water is this almost black brown sand color. So I'm going to paint it with water first and then I'm going to throw in some really nice darks and hope for the best. Sometimes in watercolor you just kind of hope for the best. So if I do it right it will look like sand to paint it, I'm waiting until the watercolor is a little bit dry, but not all the way dry. Because I want it to flow, but not bleed too much. And most of the work of watercolor painting is learning how to judge the right timing. Timing is going to determine how much your colors bleed together or the lines stay stiff and straight. So you need to know how your paint is going to behave with the water in order to be a successful watercolor painter. And the only way to get really comfortable with that is by practicing and practicing and practicing. So yeah, I kind of like that. Now there's some other colors in the reflected area. There's some yellows right in here. They're not very strong, but I'm going to add just a touch of that color to get it in there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then I'm going to darken up this patch of sand because it's very dark in the picture and down here as well. But all my water is really wet. My grass is still wet. And so before I go any farther, oh, and I forgot this dark line up here. It's the same dark. So now I'm going to let this dry again. When we come back, we'll work on the foreground and adding the details. Okay, we're looking okay here, but obviously it needs a lot of work. So let's start by putting in this foreground shape of the grass. I'm going to use my flat on the side 
And since this grass is closer to the foreground, I'm going to start by adding more detail from the very beginning. Just make sure that you're not too timid with your colors. They're going to fade and then all your work will be wasted. So when you're painting in the foreground, paint boldly. And I really like to let the colors mix on the page. So I'll have some spots of just pure yellow and then some darker spots of green. We'll let some browns mix in there for the dirt. Watercolor affords you a kind of a unique opportunity to do some careful planning, but then also hold back and let the medium do a lot of the work for you. I like to use the back of a paintbrush and then flick up through the paint like this to create some of those grass shapes. It's faster than the brush, it also looks better and more natural. Now I'm going to go back and start to polish up with the details starting from the bottom down. So that means I'm going to go into the castle here first. There are definite shadow shapes. So this side of the castle, this side, this side are in shadow. So the first thing that we're going to do is darken up the shadow side of the castle with a slightly darker version of that same gray. Yeah, that'll look good. And I'm going to go straight over, but carefully avoiding the highlight um, side of this little turret. And then in the windows, I see some highlights. So I'm going to go around the windows. I'm going to draw the outline carefully, and then I'm going to fill in a little more quickly. Now, being careful not to add too much water to the mix, because I want it to look like the same color, I'm going to do the next shadow side the same way. And then we're going to have this shadow come down here, and it's cast on the wall here. So we're going to have to darken it up with another color, but I'll set it in, in the same color for now, just to keep those colors nice and smooth. And you can see how much detail you can get just by using the edge of your flat brush. And then I'm going to do a little bit of work on the smaller turrets up here. They look almost like chimneys. I don't know what they're called in a castle. Let's add some shadows to them, shall we? There's this one and this one. And then the roof looks almost purple. So I'll cut that in the same way. Then I'm going to rinse it out and get that stony color on the brush again. And do some of the work in the rock um, fence. So I'm just using the brush on the corner and I'm going to go in and sort of dab some pretty um, irregular stone shapes. I don't want the colors to look too regular so I'm going to skip around with one color and then I'm going to rinse that off my brush and find another color slightly different but still it's stone color so here I'll add a little red to it. And they'll all mix together for the viewer's eye to make a kind of natural looking stone fence. And I'm going to go back into the waterway too, now that it's dry, and add some of those darker, more intense shadow colors. And by the grass, I'm going to go around some of these individual blades. That sort of detail really helps to add a little bit of pizzazz to the finished piece. When you have these small, intricate shapes close up, especially around the um, lines that I protected with masking fluid, I'm going to go nice and dark. And also, I'm going to add some of those dark rock shapes. If you need to, you can redraw those before you start painting them. I'm just using the edge of the brush, though, and I'll fill in some interesting little shapes like I see on the reference material these darks that sort of skip over the surface. And now I'm filling in some dark a little bit higher and adding some rocks up here in the same way. During this phase, just really look closely to your reference material. Take your time and try to paint what you see. You can take as many breaks as you want. Of course, you're not in a race. You're trying to make the best painting that you can, so always err on the side of taking a break, and that gives you two benefits. First of all, you're going to come back with a renewed energy and be able to really put the time in and get it as detailed as you want. But secondly, 
whenever you take a break from the piece and come back, you are able to look at it with fresh eyes. And you can see problems in the composition and as in the painting as a whole that you can't see when you're continually working at it really, really close up like you need to when you're doing the detail work. Now I'm going to switch to a small round and I'm going to do some more details in the castle. You really don't have to do everything that you see. In fact, you're often going to work against yourself if you try to paint everything that you see because the eye is going to make any level of details that you put into the painting, it's going to shoot it up a level. So it's easy to overpaint and get too detailed. Whereas if you can just learn to give a suggestion and let the eye fill in the rest for you, the viewer will have a satisfying sense of things looking just the way they ought to. I'll do some windows. And sometimes you don't know until you've put a color down that it needs adjusting. If you find that your color does need to be adjusted, like here making this shadow a lot darker, don't be afraid to make those changes. In these small details, you're going to get a lot more strength from the things that you don't paint than the darks that you do paint. So remember to always keep those little white lines. It's the white details that really bump things up a level for you. Okay, I'm gonna let those shadow shapes all dry. And while it's drying, I'm gonna go into the shrubs and the foliage with a darker accent color. And I'm going to pay close attention to my reference material. It looks like the darks are on like the underside of these clumps of bushes. So I'm going to use a small little round brush and I'm going to carefully add some of those little details, just like this. Let your painting suggest to you where the most natural place should be, and also look for the reference material for the general technique. That doesn't mean that you need to match up every single bush and plant that you see on the reference material. You do want it to look like the same sort of bushes though, so that's why you look to the reference material for the technique and then apply it as it fits best in your painting. A simple dry brush stippling technique will work really well to suggest details without overpowering. So just sort of bounce your brush up and down and let those details appear on their own. See so if you just add a little bit of dark here and there, you wind up accenting the whole plant and making it look more intentional and giving it a little bit more substance. And in the stone fence, I'm going to do a similar thing. I'm going to take my dark, make sure that I have enough paint off the brush so that I can get a nice fine line, and then I'm going to work around some of those stones just enough so that in general it will look like shadows falling between the rocks on this stony fence. And just take your time filling in around those rocks. I'm going to do that off camera and then come back to you and show you how to use that texture technique on the castle walls. Okay, let's take a stab at that texture on the castle. I'm going to use a sponge. I'm going to get it a little bit damp and then I'm going to dip it in a mixture of some darks. I'll do a test to make sure it's this right color family. Looks good. And then I'm just going to sponge right over the top. Now the trick is that you don't want it to look too much like the texture that you're making it with instead of the texture it's supposed to be. So I want to start with the sponge, but I don't want it to look too sponged on if that makes sense. So I'm going to loosen it up a little bit with the spritz of the water and then use some of those same colors. And while that water is still wet, I'm going to brush over the top with this new texturing device as well. Now I'm going to let that dry. I can do some more work though um, in the water and in the foreground. And I'll use the brush on the side and just fill in some of this. If I use the brush on the side then I get an interesting broken look. It doesn't quite fill everything in and it picks up some of the texture of the paper and it skips over the top so I get some nice darks and some natural shadows, just like ripples on the water. I'm going to use that same brush and roll some more texture over this side of the castle. See, I can just let it skip over the top. 
And this side here looks a different color, almost like it's gotten mossy or something. So I have a cool browny green mixed up. I'll go back and add some of this interesting green into some of the other parts of the field. It's always better to have multiple colors mixing on the page. Now going to the foreground, I'm going to rub off that masking fluid. And when you first take the masking fluid off, it's usually going to be too stark. So then you'll have to do a little bit of work blending it into the rest of the page and making it look organic with your painting. So I'll just use some green, some dark green, and cover up if the bottoms of those lines got a little bit blobby. A few accent grasses here and there will draw the eye. And then I'm going to water them down a little bit so that they blend in. Then add a few more. This, this takes time, but it really is worth it for making a foreground that looks quite different from the rest of the painting. Helps things to stand out. And it gives it more dimension because you can see things in the front, can't see as much in the back, and that gives your painting depth. You might need to add a little bit more dark to some of these shapes in the water. That's something that you need to determine by walking away and then coming back to the painting and looking again. I might want to make the castle darks a little bit darker. The contrast isn't quite right. So I think I'm going to go back into some of the places on the castle. So I'm just going to go and do a little bit of this kind of work, finishing it up. Oh, we forgot this whole patch right here, didn't we? So let me fill that in. It looks like kind of a scrubby patch. So I'll fill it in with a blase brown and then have a few twigs coming up. Draw some of those in with a handle, just like I did before. And then I'm going to add some darks, especially on the side that's right next to the castle wall. And then a little shadow over there. That might be all I need on that. When I look at it, I see that these bushes in the background are quite pushing back enough either, so I'm going to darken them up some more. So let me go off camera one last time and um, see if there are any other little places that I need to darken. I'm just going to let it rest, pretty much. And then I'll come back one more time and show you the finished result. I added a little bit more detail to the castle to help that to pop out forward a little bit more. I might add just a bit more of that sort of detail. So I'm going to use a shadow color, test it, and I'll drag it on this little area of the castle that I see in the picture has some more detail. Sometimes it happens when you're painting that you don't really know what is uh, important until you paint the painting and it doesn't look quite right because those things have been left off. So the good thing is you can just go back and add them. Expect that your first paintings are not going to be very good and don't be discouraged by that. If you can just keep going, it's going to get easier and easier and you're going to have more and more success. All right, I think I'm gonna leave it here. I'm pleased with the balance, I like the contrasts, and I think that I captured the things that I like from the original reference material in my painting. So that is everything you need to know about painting this castle. I really hope that you're gonna try it on your own. All you need to do is download the reference material, you'll get a really high quality printout, and then just go to work. Paint it multiple times if you need to. So best of luck to you and thanks so much for watching.